we've already discussed, and I won't belabor the point, that we spend a lot of time indoors, and particularly in our home environments. And this is something that I spend a lot of time thinking about, particularly as it relates to children. Um, and w while we're in home, we think about being protected from things like allergens and, and the, the weather. Um, but we are exposed to a lot of different chemicals that are higher indoors and outdoors through both inhalation, dermal absorption is also important, and also what I refer to as inadvertent dust ingestion. Um, we don't envision ourselves as consuming a lot of dust, but we are actually uh, exposed to dust and do accidentally ingest that from occasion. And we know that there's a lot of chemicals that accumulate in dust. It's a sink for, uh, dust is a sink for many chemicals. And we know from all the work on lead, that accumulation of lead um, in dust is an exposure route for children. Um, and I've always been really interested in understanding how building materials in particular and consumer products influence our exposure in the home environment. Um, particularly as there's been a lot of changes in particularly building codes, and building codes are a really big driver in what we're exposed to. Um, and this was mentioned earlier, I think Barbara brought this up, but this is also something I think about how home construction has changed so much even just over the past hundred years, right? So, I mean, even thinking about the um, insulation up here, oh, here we go, right? About a hundred years ago, um, we used a lot of fiberglass. I know we use asbestos and we, we wised up and we don't use it anymore. But today, we use a lot of um, the materials that are more energy efficient, um, but we use a lot of polyurethane, um, a lot of um, polystyrene. I know they have better uh, heat protection, but these also are made from polymers, from petroleum sources, and they have a lot of chemical additives in them. Right? This is a picture of spray foam insulation, that most spray foam, foam insulation has a high concentration of flame retardants called trischloropropyl phosphate. Uh, we did some work with a group up at Amherst and showed that people that are applying this insulation in residences have the highest exposure that I've ever seen. We've measured their urinary metabolites. They were so high, they flooded my detector, and I had to actually dilute their urine samples down a hundredfold to actually measure what was in there. Right? So there's just a lot of chemicals in there. Um, but even furniture, this is another interest of mine. We do a lot of work on flame retardants. But you think about furniture 100 years ago, we used a lot more natural materials. We used cotton, we used um, uh, cotton materials, we used wood, you know, stone uh, in our building materials. Right? They're very different. But today, we really want the nice, plush, um, polyurethane foam-filled furniture. We talked about polyurethane being a good sampler, and I thought that was really interesting. That's why we use them probably in, in air sampling, right? They absorb things. I look at it at the perspective that they're a source to the indoor environment because they have flame retardants and other additives in them as well, right? So polyurethane foam and furniture has around 5% by weight of a flame retardant chemical in that product, right? And so that's a source of exposure, right? So even things like introduction of electricity and plumbing, uh, making these homes more energy efficient, all these have led to changes in the materials and thus the chemicals that we're surrounded with. And now there's a big trend, right? Homes are bigger you know, on the smaller pieces of land, right? Because people want bigger homes and they don't want to take care of their lawn, at least in a lot of uh, urban areas where I live. So it's really interesting. So I always think about this in terms of, you know, do these improvements in our home come at a potential cost that are leading to higher exposures? Um, so over the past couple of years, we've been fortunate to have a, an NIH-funded study to look at children's exposure in the home environment. And we refer to that as the TESI study. Um, so here we're intentionally focusing on children between the ages of three to six, small children living in central North Carolina, um, particularly around Durham, North Carolina, if you know where that is. Um, and we recruited families um, that had children of this age between 2014 and 2016, 203 children from 190 homes. So we had some siblings in our study. So we had a team of researchers that went to these homes, and we collected a variety of different samples in the home to characterize products in the home to understand how it relates to children's exposure. Um, so we did a lot of dusting. People were quite happy we'd come in and clean their, their homes. So we collected dust. Um, we, we did have some air samplers in the home. We also collected what I'll call biopsies of the furniture in this case. So we didn't want to tear into people's sofas, but if people had a zipper on it, we'd ask them politely if they'd allow us to open that up and collect a very small sample of the polyurethane film inside their cushions so we could characterize the flame retardant chemical treatments in that furniture and understand how it relates to children's exposure. And then we had hand wipes um, from children because they were also a good measure of your exposure in the home environment. And we had uh, pooled urine samples and serum samples. So we were kind of looking at the relationships between these different types of samples. Um, and I will point out we tried to intentionally sample a large, um, a, a large population with different demographics. Um, so our population was about 40% non-Hispanic white, 37% non-Hispanic black, and 20% Hispanic, right, to try to cover dem all demographics in the Durham area. So what I'm showing you here um, is a relationship between uh, urinary levels of a flame retardant metabolite 
uh, in these children's urine in homes that did have a specific type of flame retardant versus did not have that flame retardant. So if you were to go and you can look at your furniture at home, you might find this label on it that says this article meets the flammability requirements, California Technical Bulletin 117. That California state standard drove a lot of use of flame retardants in residential furniture across the United States. Uh, it was an open flame standard. Industry met that by adding flame retardants to the foam. It was amended in 2014, so now it has a label saying yes or no, it has a flame retardant, and they changed it from open flame to a smolder standard, so this is leading to changes, um, but that is relatively recent. So what we did is we actually analyzed those foam pieces, um, and we have a lot of information on what's being used in, in polyurethane foam, and here we just categorized children's urine samples about whether, are they living in a home where in this case a flame retardant called Firemaster 550 was present in their sofa, compared to homes where it was not present in the sofa. And this was statistically significant. And I will point out that this urinary metabolite that we measured can actually come from other sources as well, but we know it's actually a metabolite of this flame retardant as well. Um, when we looked at what was on their hands, that was quite statistically significant. So 160% higher levels of these components in Firemaster 550 on the children's hands um, in homes where it was in the sofa relative to homes where it was not in the sofa. And I'll point out that these were quite statistically significant. And remember, this is only one product we tested in the home, just the sofa. We didn't test any other chairs, mattresses, anything else. It was the sofa. That was the only thing we tested. So it was really interesting and suggests to us that these are sources of exposure. Um, that was in urine. We also um, had blood samples from these children. Uh, there's a different flame retardant called Penta-BDE that's also heavily used or was heavily used. It was actually phased out in 2005 due to concerns about its toxicity and persistence. Um, but this has a very long half-life, and actually people still have sofas in their home that contain this flame retardant mixture, even though they stopped manufacturing it in 2005. So we had some children that had penta -BDE in their sofa, some that did not. And here's the differences in the dust levels. Um, it was about 24 times higher in the dust of homes where penta -BDE was present in that one sofa relative to homes where it wasn't. And here are the differences in the children's serum level. It was about seven times higher in children living in those homes with penta in the sofa compared to homes where it was not. And this is actually very similar to a study we published in 2016 in an adult cohort. This is a children's cohort, so we were looking at the differences there. Um, the other thing we looked at was the, the type of flooring in the home. I think we mentioned before the issue of phthalates and flooring, and this is another concern. You know, how much exposure do you get from phthalates based on the type of flooring or other products in the home? Um, some phthalates are considered endocrine disruptors um, or have certain toxicities associated with them. So in our, in our study, what we did is we went into the home and we characterized the type of flooring in all the different rooms, and we had a laser meter. We actually recorded the dimensions of the room um, that had vinyl in them specifically. So what I'm showing you here is the um, urinary levels of a specific metabolite called benzobutyl phthalate. It was actually mentioned this morning, I think, in Nina's talk or uh, Dr. Corsi's talk about um, phthalates and vinyl flooring. So if you categorize the home by what percentage of the flooring was vinyl, and you correlate that to the children's urinary metabolite for benzyl butyl phthalate, we found that there was a 15-fold difference between children's living in homes where all of the flooring was vinyl versus homes where there was no vinyl whatsoever. And then you get these intermediate categories in between. Um, I will point out that the children here, the, these homes that had 100% vinyl, all those children in this case were actually children living in public housing in Durham, North Carolina. Um, I'm not sure how representative the public housing is in Durham relative to other areas, but a lot of the public housing was just concrete block construction and all the flooring was kind of a cheap vinyl grade material. Um, now we did not sample the vinyl flooring in these homes, but I will say we've sampled vinyl flooring um, in other homes and certainly we know benzyl butyl phthalate is there. Um, now today, the flooring industry has made um, big steps to remove benzyl butyl phthalate from vinyl flooring. Um, and to our knowledge, and we analyzed some new samples, it looks like they replaced it with diaxyl terephthalate, which we know less about. It's okay. Um, so we know that the kids living in these homes had uh, levels in their urine that if you back calculate, suggest they're about 30% of the reference dose for a health advisory. Um, we also looked at drywall, um, or fungicides and drywall. So what's interesting is that there's this new class of uh, fungicides being used, uh, strobilurins, more known for being used on protos, particularly things like strawberries and grapes, um, not thought to be used indoors, but it turns out that one of these is oxystroman, is using green guard uh, technologies that are applied to um, you know, wall board, drywall, particularly purple board, which I always thought of be just being used in bathrooms for mold uh, concerns, but it turns out they're actually being advertised for the whole house. 
We actually tested some of this material and indeed found azoxystrobin in 10 out of the 11 samples that we, um, we purchased, brand new, from home improvement stores. Um, and there's this new study that actually ranked azoxystrobin as the number two fungicide for their risk quotient um, based on aquatic toxi tox toxicity. And here are the measurements of these strobulin pesticides in the dust samples from this cohort. Um, what's interesting is so we looked for four different strobilurins. Three of them had pretty low detection frequencies from 35 to 69 percent, but azoxystrobin, the one that is used in, uh, as a fungicide in drywall, was detected most frequently and with the highest abundance. These are bean plots, if people are familiar with them. This is a log scale, I would point out. And several of the homes had several thousand parts per billion of this uh, fungicide in the house dust. Um, we weren't able to, or we didn't account for renovations, so we're not sure exactly if these higher levels correlate with homes that had more recent renovations. Um, because this is a new introduction to drywall, I think it was around 2002 that it was introduced, um, but it was really interesting to us. Um, we're also really interested in what else is in house dust. You know, we've been working with a colleague of mine to do non-targeted analysis on dust. So instead of saying, let's look for phthalates, let's look for pesticides, look for everything that's in house dust. So we've done an analysis here just of 10 house dust samples, and what we found was more than 30,000 different signals, which are presumably different chemicals in dust samples, and we've only accounted for maybe 380 of them. Um, and so there's just a lot there we don't know about. And I also guess the question is, I dabble in toxicology, are these mixtures um, potentially active um, in terms of uh, upregulating and downregulating systems in our body? And what we did is we actually took house dust samples, extracted everything out of there, and ran them as an in vitro test to look at characterized thyroid toxicity. And we found that there is definitely some samples that if you just looked at the mass of dust um, in a dose response, we found this activity with uh, antagonism, thyroid, human thyroid nuclear receptor beta, whereas some dust samples had none, some had high. These are microgram per mil levels, so microgram levels of dust. EPA assumes children ingest 50 milligrams of dust per day. So this is a very environmentally relevant dose. And what you see here is that actually the activity of the dust samples was correlated with serum fired hormone levels of residents living in that home. Um, so this was very interesting to us. No one's kind of ever taken this approach by looking at mixtures that are present in house dust. Could be a coincidence, I'm not sure. It certainly needs to be replicated. But this is something that's just interesting to us. So I know I'm out of time. Um, well, these are just my takeaway points, that there's, there's a lot of products in our home that I think that we need to be looking at a little bit more clearly to understand how we're exposed to them, particularly for children, um, and just understand these risks a little bit better. So I'll end there, and thank you. It was by so quick. <laughs>